we started talking about this, it being a you know a specific anniversary. It was you know twenty five years since Horoscope, since we had put that out. So that kind of put in our heads, you know, maybe it's a chance to do Horoscope, uh, the Horoscope record from top to bottom. Uh, it was our biggest selling record. Uh, it kind of made sense to do. And then as we started to think about really the particulars of doing the show. It seemed like, what could we do that's kind of special, that makes it a little different? I know a lot of bands have done it before, and that's when we started to get into the idea of maybe do two records in their entirety, because we just hadn't seen anyone do that. So the idea was to was to double it up, uh, make one night special, uh, actually where it started, because um, when I looked back and uh, did a little bit of uh, research, and uh, I was reminded by uh, going through Google that our first... Uh, live video recording was uh, 30 years earlier in the same uh, part of Germany in the in the Ruhrpott. We actually was uh, a bit of a homecoming uh, for especially for that Feel the Fire record.
It's a high quality sound at the carriage house. This is our Steinway. I was shocked when Dee Dee Verney told me that Horoscope was their highest charting and best selling record. I was absolutely shocked. I did not expect that at all. When he told me about them doing Feel the Fire and Horoscope in their entirety at a show, my first, re like, okay, Feel the Fire, first record, maybe some anniversary thing, whatever, but I was like, why Horoscope? And he said, it's our biggest record. I go, what? Like, it, it floored me when he told me that. The foundation was laid with the hardcore metal fans. Then we got a major label deal, got a little bit of video play. Then we went our next record on a major, even more video play. Then another with Atlantic involved. More video play, the band's really coming together. Everything's building, more touring, more people saw us. And then here comes, here comes the horoscope record. I think it was really about what was done before it, and it was just the right time. It took, it took some time uh, to get used to tracks like New Machine, Nice Day for a Funeral, or Solitude. Um, because like I said, they were bringing in new influences, at least for me they were new, and combining them with the thrashier side of songs like Coma or Thanks for, for Nothing.
we always have had a great crew. We always, we've always, you know, kept them close. I know that people have heard that from other bands too. But this is, uh, we try to use the same people on a on a constant basis. Uh, I, I mentioned Dolores. Uh, she also TMs for us. Uh, she's kind of in charge of the whole thing out there on the road. Uh, we use uh, Brovar on guitars, who is just fantastic P- guy from Poland, and he's introduced us to uh, Michael, whose last name I still can't pronounce this for this long, so we call him Michael, the Polish drum tech, <laughs> which is, I, I suppose, with a name like that, you could have your own television show. <laughs> and so, uh, Big E on the lights. Uh, Eric's been with us since um, uh, early 2000. Um, so this is uh, over 15 years. Eric has been uh, our light guy, and many, many know him by uh, not just the uh, the size of Be- Big Eric, but also the size of his heart and his uh, proficiency with those lights. I mean, he's he's all about that strobe light and making the overkill show bigger. Um, out in the front of house, we had uh, um, uh, doing sound was uh, Lucifer uh, or Lisa, <laughs> Le- Lucifer. We actually call her Lucifer. Uh, was doing sound that night, and Sophie was doing uh, merch. So, I mean, this is a good crew and a crew that we had traveled with for a long period of time. And, and you know, and it's always been kind of uh, equal partnership with us. You know, everybody's that valuable. You know, without a great crew, you can't do a great show. It's good to be back in Deutschland. Where Thrash is fucking king. We have one rule tonight. I'm in fucking charge because I say so. You ready? Come on now, don't disappoint me. You ready?
So learning the songs and rehearsals. We actually did rehearse uh, these songs because obviously we've never played them before as a band, at least some of them. I mean, we've done a bunch, but there were a bunch we didn't do. Um, I mean, learning them was painless. I mean, really, it wasn't very much to it. Uh, it was just really remembering the arrangements. And uh, I guess that's about it, really. Um, yeah, I did have to learn a bunch of solos and uh, change a few things around to get them into key especially some of the older ones, um, just to kind of make them a little more modern. You know, when you go back and you kind of are learning them and you're figuring out what you're playing, you know, I, I can remember being in, in, uh, in base and, you know, in the basement with, uh, you know, with the guys writing the stuff and kind of where your head was at back in the day. And so some of that came in, which is, which is always kind of cool, you know, that's fun. Um, but, I knew a lot of, like I said, I, I, I knew a lot of the stuff kind of off the top of my head. I mean, half the time I can't remember my wallet or my keys, but a song for the most part, once I've written it or recorded it, it's kind of in my head forever. I mean, I could call up almost every, any Overkill song right off the top of my head. Uh, but you do have to touch base on them because there are some parts that'll come up, they'll sneak up on you and you just have no clue about a part i mean you just have no idea what's coming and then when you listen you say oh wow that's a pretty cool part <laughs> especially with you know feel the fire and horoscope there's a bunch of songs that we've never done before for example kill the command um live young die free um and you know i sit in my little studio and i pick apart the songs and i think i know what's going on and what's being played and this and that and then we get into the room and i sit down with Vernie and dave and you know I sit there and I start playing what I think is it. And they go, oh, no, 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 it's this.
Horoscope's been in the set. Coma comes in and out, Infectious. Uh, but to do songs like Blood Money, to do Live Young, Die Free, these were the ones that were exciting for me because they felt like they were new, even though they were still ours. You know, they, they felt like, you know, these are the ones that we had to put the time in. So I think, you know, for me personally, the success is the way that those songs came out. And as far as, uh, as, far as the Horoscope record is concerned, I mean, Coma is just, just crushing. I mean, just all out, just blistering thrash. And then the flip side of that is the title track, which is just this plodding, thick, heavy, sort of Sabbathy thing. That's where you can make the case where people sort of say that Overkill didn't differentiate it all in their music. Well, just listen to those two tracks.
Yes, man. Good to see all you motherfuckers. This is a special fucking night. You renamed the city Overhausen. Dungeon. My mother was right. I was very special when I was young. You like this horoscope record now, don't you? Gives me a hard fucking dick. Let's do some more of it. We've been getting ready for a couple of weeks. We've been getting ready for 30 fucking years. Who am I kidding?
for for Showtime, honestly, I always feel bad for you know our tour manager who or whoever's with us because we don't really have a routine to get to the stage or to start a show. It's kind of like herding cats, you know. It's like uh, Dave. Dave is usually up on stage early, way early, um, like for set change. Because he puts his ears in and he brings some beers up there and he has a few beers and he warms up back, you know, behind the back line. So he's on stage. So we never really see him before a show. Um, Derek, me and Blitz are around some. Eddie was not around really too much. He likes to get up there a little bit earlier too. Or he's actually, Eddie be warming up more so um, in the dressing room. Sometimes we have to tell him to get the fuck out because he's making so much goddamn noise with those uh, pedals and sticks warming up. Um, but the rest of us, it's kind of one guy wanders up, one guy wanders up, and then, you know, it's it's up to our crew to run around and say, is the whole band here? Is, is the band here? And they kind of count off and go, okay, there's five people here. Let's start the show. So <laughs> it's kind of, I, I, I guess, I don't know how their bands do it, but that that's the way it is for us. Anything different for the show? Um, well, you know, been doing shows for many, many, many years, and uh, most of the times what I would actually do is when I put on stage clothes or anything like that, I would actually put my pants on first, then my boots. But I decided this night, because this was such a special event, that I was actually going to put my boots on first, then my pants. And it turned out to be a um, really interesting situation uh but i got it done and uh everything worked out show went great
we go, right? We got a lot of fucking music to do tonight for you people. Good old thrash in Germany, nothing fucking better. <laughs> Loud, fast, hard, cold beer. Cold German beer. What a fucking great place, man. <laughs> I feel like I'm 50 years old again, this is fucking killer. How you doing upstairs, all right? Let's continue this madness. We're going to run it right down the fucking line. Just like we did back in 91. This one's called Live Young, Die Free.
I told uh, I told those guys it'd be the first time we ever perform Live Young Die Free. First time and last. He said you'll never after eleven o'clock tonight you will never have to remember how this song goes again ever. We'll see. I don't, I don't see us doing that one again. Although Dave likes that one, I'm like, eh, I don't know. Maybe.
Well, we had this great idea that we were going to film uh, a DVD and record our first two records. Um, and we booked it and we had it all set to go. Uh, and then we, um, then we had some issues with Ron. Um, he, he just, you know, kind of real life kind of jumped up on him and, and work related stuff and things he had to take care of. And, uh, we wanted Ron to do it. It really kind of made sense. It was kind of, he had done the last four records with us and this was kind of a culmination point. Um, and Ron had been, had been in the band for about 10 years. So we felt like, you know, this will be great. Uh, and we did everything we could to try and make it happen with Ron. Um, but it just was not gonna, he just had too many things going on. Wasn't going to be able to get away. So, uh, we started thinking, what should we do? You know, does, do we just cancel the whole thing? We had already sold tickets. Uh, we had announced the whole thing. Seemed like the, the fans would be really disappointed. Uh, we th- talked about a bunch of different options. Um, but probably the best option was that we should get somebody to play the show since Ron couldn't. Uh, and then the the next call after that was to Eddie Garcia. Eddie Garcia uh, had been with us as long as Ron, but Eddie in the capacity of uh, sound man. We always, we always felt great going into uh, situations where we had little time to set up because we said uh, we had two secret weapons, one Eddie and one Ron, and uh, we could pull a show off under any circumstances. Uh, but Eddie was also uh, is also a drummer, an accomplished drummer too, and uh, slid in uh, to help us out, uh, so to, as to not have to fuck up the schedule we had set for ourselves. Eddie was behind the kit and and rehearsing and and did a stellar job um, in in a short amount of time. So he became uh, he became uh, Sticks uh, Eddie Garcia behind the drums, the executioner. So um, you know we will be forever grateful to uh, the executioner. Uh, well, the day of the show and, and leading up to it, um, it was, for me, it was pretty daunting, uh, as for that tour, I had to learn like 27 songs and, uh, seven of those songs were only going to be played at the very last show. And then some of those songs, uh, you know, uh, besides, uh, Didi and Blitz, n- none of us had played them together ever. So he had to learn, uh, a regular tour set as well as both records, and not in a lot of time either. I gotta tell you, he um, will always be grateful to him that he busted his ass. I mean, he had headphones on, buried with those songs, you know, over and over and over every single day. Eddie knocked it out of the park, Um, you know, especially, you know, somebody asking you to learn 21 songs, and by the way, we're gonna be doing a tour with that, and we're gonna be filming a one-show DVD with this, so, you know, uh, and Eddie was up for it. Eddie grabbed it by the horns and ran with it, and dragged it into the end zone for a touchdown. Uh, I will always, you know, think that Eddie is a really, a great drummer, and a really, really class act for, you know, knocking it through the uplights. Love you, my brother.
It's hard to say why Overkill didn't break through bigger at the time. It's the same question you can almost ask about right now, because there are a lot of people, myself included, that feel to some degree Overkill are a criminally underrated band. And I absolutely believe that. To me, I've always said this, that you've got the big four, but if I was to expand that to a big five, Overkill would be immediately in that grouping. So now if you ask somebody on the West Coast, they might give you a different answer because Overkill is an East Coast band. I think that on the West Coast, they had Testament and a lot of people would put Testament as that number five band. 
If you talk to East Coast people, they'd probably put Overkill there, or maybe some would put Exodus there. So it's kind of like really depends upon where you're from and what your perspective is. But for me, Overkill was every bit as vital and as great and as making as great a music as any of the bands of that time. And I still love their records. I still think that to this day, they're really, unfortunately, for whatever reason, not held in the same regard as other bands from that period. They don't seem to be bothered by it as much as their fans do. Didi and Blitz being the two original guys left. I mean, I've talked to them about it many times. They're pretty easygoing about it and they're just happy they're making a living. They've got the fan base they do. I think uh, the, the byproduct of that, the upside of that though, is the fans that they do have now are incredibly passionate and loyal to them. They may not have as many fans as Metallica, they certainly don't, but the fans they do have are as passionate and hardcore about Overkill as any of the most hardcore Metallica fans would be. So that that's a trade-off that a lot of people would definitely be happy with and would be willing to, to take, and I think that's kind of how they look at it. They've, they've built a great career, They've made a living out of being in a band and playing this music, uncompromising music. But uh, yeah, the the whole next rung, I think, has always eluded them as far back as Feel the Fire, and to me, even to this very day. If you attend an Overkill show, you're pretty sure you get the full treatment. I mean, that's why a lot of people always go and see them live on every tour every year. It's kind of a ritual. I mean, it's like, they were called the Motorhead of Thrash once, and I guess they live up to that name.
Well, I think Feel the Fire is significant because it was the first record that had the first overkill on it, which became this, I don't know how many overkills they've done since, but it's become a big a big thing in, in the, it would become a big ongoing thing in the band's history. Uh, the song Feel the Fire is a song that I remember so many times going into Lemoore's and hearing them play over the PA and, you know, Blitz singing that part, you know, higher, higher, I mean, people love that and I would tell Didi for years I'm like you guys got to put that back in the set and he's just like Didi was always like oh it's so primitive I'm not playing that rumbling bass thing I'm not gonna I'm not do playing that I'm like but the fans want to hear it and then finally they started doing it again so and then Rotten to the Core which is maybe an all-time overkill classic which to this day is still I think one of the big songs in in their set so there's some some landmark songs on there for sure. You know, Rotten to the Core is always a fun song to play. Uh, even all these years, you know, I I don't think Rotten to the Core has ever been out of our set uh, since the day we wrote it. And uh, playing that, especially for German fans, are um, they are um, you know the German fans are just you know some of the best in the world, and uh, they they don't like just the new stuff. They like your old records too, and they expect to hear both. So. Uh, and that song always lights them up. Everybody's always singing, no matter where we go. Um, that one, to this day, I mean, it's you know going on you know thirty something years now. It's uh, still f a fun song to play. Definitely a fun song to play.
es ist schön, wieder hier zu sein. In Overhausen. It's been 30 fucking years. 30 years ago. 30 years ago in April. Over in Bochum at the Zesha, we were on the Metal Hammer Road Show. And it was our first tour. And it was our first fucking DVD. It wasn't even a DVD, it was a VHS fucking bullshit cassette. So I guess we said we'd be back and we were not lying. So, danke schön, Deutschland.
there's songs that have remained in the Overkill set um, since these records came out. Uh, songs like Rotten to the Core. Um, you know, we've revisited Raise the Dead. We've done the song Overkill. Uh, Blood and Iron and Hammerhead have been in and out of the set. So we, we've known these songs. But the, the ones to, to me that were fun or important to do were ones like There's No Tomorrow or Second Sun because we hadn't done them in forever. We played Blood and Iron a couple times. Um, it was great to play Raise the Dead. Um, you know, there's no tomorrow. Um, it's, it's kind of really fun to play those songs cause it kind of really breaks it up. Cause you know, we, like I said, is we've been doing, you know, rotten to the core hammerhead, you know, all those songs for years and years and years and all these other songs, you know, are like, it's like fresh. It's almost like we're, we're playing brand new songs. He 
is a skull crusher. Him, him. On the fucking drums, helping us out, sitting in, doing the right fucking thing. From the great state of Texas, the band Pissing Razors, and he's been in our family for 10 fucking years. On the drums, Irish Eddie Garcia. We call him the Mexicutioner. And I can hear him itching back there because he wants to show you what he can do. And he keeps whispering in my motherfucking ear. He's like, dude, dude. And I'm like, all right. And he says, have a hand. Let's go. 
of New Jersey. Diddy Bernie.
mom. Hello, mom, I'm in, I'm in Overhausen with about 1,500 really good fucking friends. Metal is in your motherfucking blood, isn't it? It's in your blood. It's in your heart and your motherfucking soul. Deutschland, you make me proud to call myself a metalhead. Danke schön. One more. We're doing a whole fucking record. We might even play for another couple of days. Some of these songs we haven't played in a long fucking time. Some we never played. All these we haven't played in a long time. <laughs> All of these. These. This mess. Yeah. There's a lot of starting off songs that we're fucking up. But by the time it gets to you, it'll be all perfect. The Killer Command Saga. This was, uh, uh, obviously, I mean, you would know it. It's a, a, a song of Feel the Fire toward the end of the record. And, uh, you know, not something we had done since the early days. I mean, I don't remember doing this this song uh, after, like, the 80s. And maybe not even after 87, when, when Taking Over had come out. I think Blitz made it look like uh, like maybe he didn't know the words, uh, but it, it wasn't that he doesn't know the words. It was just that none of us knew where the fuck we were. Um, kind of started off okay. You know, the song started off, we were all good, and then somewhere along the line, uh, we just got turned around. Well, uh, the only thing that I could say about Killer Command is, is that I, myself, Derek Taylor, played that song absolutely perfectly it was the other four guys in the band that fucked it up royally it's pretty simple really it's our director's fault yeah kevin custer he uh he put up the wrong cue cards and quite frankly really fucked up um yeah we just uh well you know i mean he, he screwed everything up i mean what are you supposed to do about a thing like that directors and their damn director's eyes 30 years to feel the fucking fire because of you this song was maybe played live once or twice in our whole career. So something special tonight, it's called Killer Command. Oh! 
Kill 
You made this fucking night great, man. We were thinking to ourselves, it just wouldn't be the same without ending this the way that we usually end it, if you know what I mean. We have a long history, and we still make noise today. And we're honored to say that this was the first place on the whole fucking world that we toured was Deutschland. But always remember, remember, we don't care what you say! Fapistic! We don't care what you say! The thing about Overkill is, after all these years, 
to me, I see them now. They're as good as they ever been. They've ever been. I mean, they're really like a machine. And I love the fact that to me, their fan base still seems to keep growing, despite not being much airplay or the the commercial viability of the music they they play. I think that when you stick around and persevere as long as they have, there's people are just going to immediately. You have no you have no choice but to not respect what they've done and how they've stayed and hung in there with it and done it on their terms. Blitz and Bernie, you know, I mean, those guys are, you know, to be honest with you, they're they're legends, you know, and they're, you know, I mean, you can't really, uh, you can't really deny that. I mean, after all these years putting out all these records and still going strong, you know, it, it is what it is. And I'm, you know, I'm proud to, you know, be on stage with those guys, or the, being a part of this band and making, Making Overkill history. I'm very glad to be a part of making Overkill history. We've been working on this for a year and a half, and it seemed like I blinked my eyes and it was gone. But I, but I do think that you know the key here is that that's the way you know all shows are. They're kind of over in a moment. It's it's about you know they're instantly history. Uh, but this is kind of history that can be recelebrated by the people that were there, or by people who weren't there, by by seeing this DVD and you know and and you know maybe seeing how hard we worked on it and 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 uh, how intently we mixed it and uh, how much production we brought in. So so I think that afterwards I was uh, you know it, it, I I kind of felt exhausted, but uh, I'm re-excited again by uh, getting up for the mix and uh, putting the artwork together and. Uh, Let's say continuing that overkill saga. The fire still burns. Really, it was just kind of a, just such a, felt like a celebration. Um, the fact that we got to do it in Germany, honestly, was, uh, was great. I mean, the German fans have been so amazing to us for forever. I mean, you know, since the day we showed up on German shores, uh, the German fans have just been absolutely phenomenal to us. And uh, when we came out for that show, when we, when we first came out for the show, and all the kids were holding up the signs that said Overhausen instead of Overhausen, you know, with the Overkill logo. And we had no idea. That was a complete surprise to the band. Um, and the Skull Crushers, of course, the Skull Crushers. It was just a great time. I mean, to have all our crew guys there, uh, you know, to have some friends and family there, you know, old time friends and family there. Um, really felt like a, a, a celebration. And it, it'll be like a night I, I never forget, you know. Um, even if we wind up doing the records again, you know, here or there, uh, it's, you know, that was the first time we did it. And um, it just it, it just was a great night. It was a great vibe. It felt cool, cool to do the records. Um, it was just a fun night. I, you know, I'll remember it for a long, long time. I put them on a stage up against anybody in that genre of music, and they will, they will hold their own. I mean, they are a powerhouse band, and it's really encouraging for me to see how good they still are live, and the fact that their fan base continues to grow. They're never gonna be the critics, darling. They're never gonna be the band that's gonna get any sort of real radio or video airplay. They're always gonna do it on their terms, the way they want. They're not bothered by it. You know, some bands are bitter that they're not bigger. We just give them a lot of respect for that. They're not, they're just very happy guys. They're happy to do what they do. Their fans are super loyal, super passionate. And I think in that genre of music, they always have been one of my favorite bands, and they still are. We are who we are. We're just five blue-collar slobs from New Jersey that make thrash metal music. Bottom line. Fuck you! 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 Fuck